Good morning, everyone, or <clears throat> good afternoon in uh, in so, some other places. And uh, we're going to start just in a few minutes. This is uh, computing and a network. Uh, we're going to give a few minutes uh, to people to arrive in the room. Um, so um, welcome, and we'll start in soon. Do not touch. So, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm not one of the chair. I'm the body stand in. They need a physical person to be here. My name is Cedric Westfall, and I'm in the future way. And I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing to start this. I don't know if the chair is, is Marie Jose or somebody on the on the line. Uh, if you if you uh, oh. if, if you log in to Miteco, you're going to be able to follow us. We or we uh, are. I mean, the instruction of the of the computer on the desk are very clear. It says, "Do not touch." Ah, okay. Well, if you have your own computer, um, so it, anyway, you can just stay there, and uh, yeah. we have everything loaded. So you should see that's us. Good. On we the hear screen. you. Okay. <laughs> So, and it should uh, be the case the that at this space, it should be the case at this point um, that you are a delegate once you log in. Maybe not on that computer, but on your own computer, you will appear. Yeah, as a I will delegate. log in onto. I'll, I'll log in the computer and uh, you go ahead because we. I think it's uh, nine thirty-four, so we started. Yeah, uh, we, we will. Okay. So, um, Eve, you want to start? Okay, and now we'll start. Uh, okay, so this is um, um, the coin computing in the network. Uh, I would like to uh, really, really thank our proxy, Cedric, who introduced himself from Future Way, uh, to be there in the room since uh, none of us uh, could travel. Um, obviously, there's the usual uh, note well. Um, and policies against harassment and everything. Uh, reminder that uh, this is the IRTF. Uh, we do not do um, standards, but we do um, research. And you will see today that we have uh, very interesting uh, research papers presented, plus a number of updates and new drafts um, Jeffrey, you want to take over? Me? Me? Yeah. yeah. So, okay, good. Uh, yes. So, before I introduce the agenda, maybe I'll remind you two things. The colleague in London, people in London. So, you 
need to follow the masking policy to wear the mask during the meet, during the meeting in the room. Second is that we maintain just one a single queue in the Miteco. So if you want to go to the mic, please also join the queue in the Miteco. So as for the agenda, so we have uh, three uh, research papers today to introduce. First, it will come from uh, Chang Gang from Oxford, He's the, from the team of Noah Zilman. He will <laughs> introduce some uh, lessons learned from their practical in-network classification implementation. And then second, Ike will introduce uh, their paper about the end-to-end -end transport layer. And uh, that they, he will discuss the very interesting topic related to end-to-end -end argument. And then Dave from Tino Munich, uh, he, uh, he, he is working together with Dr. Chosen. He will discuss the uh, DOT on uh, private, uh, private provider network. And after that, we have uh, Pasco to uh, introduce one uh, new draft about the uh, secure element implemented in the internet and how the data plan the programmable data plan can uh, uh, be used in this architecture. And if we have time, then we can discuss some future uh, of this research group. And there are some uh, initial uh, considerations from chairs and we can discuss. Yes, what did you say? Um, yeah, Eve, you want to continue now? Sure. Um, you are all here, so thank you for being here. Those of you who are already signed on, um, there, there's the pointer here to the Meet Echo, which has many um, good features, uh, not least of which is that it has many things integrated, including it automatically keeps track of who's participating, so it generates a blue sheet for us. Um, but for those of you inclined to do so, we'd really appreciate your uh, involvement in the shared note taking. Um, and there's a, uh, both a pointer here and then in the tool itself, um, there's an icon along the upper, um, along the top that also will take you uh, to the note taking, the integrated note taking. Um, we will try to also monitor the chat and um, the physical queue for questions. And um, uh, as was mentioned, we're gonna use the Meet Echo um, to maintain the queue. Uh, if everybody, of course, would default to everything being off, unless you're speaking, uh, that would be great. And, uh, and in fact, uh, in terms of the masking policy, if you are a speaker, you are allowed to um, remove your mask when you're speaking. Um, otherwise, please uh, maintain the policy. Um, uh, we welcome you to participate in our mailing list and um, you can, you know, to subscribe, we include the pointer here, but also welcome you to peruse the archives for ongoing conversation. And um, all of the materials for the session um, are available through the agenda page and through the link here. Um, as well as, again, if you go to the top icon and look for the folder, um, you can look at all of the materials and peruse them at your leisure. We have many documents that have been contributed um, to the discussion. Um, we are, uh, for our Next meeting, we are very likely to ping you if you have written one of these documents um, in order to refresh those that we would like to still consider as under the charter and maybe even in advance to being um, adopted by the working group. Um, uh, but for today's session, 
we have um, one new draft that we will um, discuss uh, uh, during the session. And with that, uh, yes, with that, we go to presentations and uh, I would uh, ask uh, the first presenter to um, load. Um, oh, maybe I can actually preload. I actually can preload. Um, stop my share. And share preload. Oh, my slide is being shared. Okay, it's fine. That's this one. No, that's not this one. Excuse me. I think all the slides were preloaded and now I can't find the. Do you want me to share it for you? I can't find the presentation of the first thought. No, here we go. Is that it? I don't know how much better I have. Which speaker are you? The presenter from, from Oxford. Could you please load your slides or share your slides? Because uh, I, I can't find did? them. I can't find them on the preloaded. Are you, are you logged in on your laptop? But can't you share from your laptop? Yeah. Then I would do this because uh, it's not. Uh, it's, uh, I mean. The the yeah the author is is the author on on Miteko. You could actually load right. from. So your the device. author we, we're gonna is gonna uh, share from his laptop the presentation I think or, or do you have a different. Because somehow I can't find the slides on the preloaded material. There or over there, they don't have the slides. You didn't share the slides with them. Yeah. Did you? No. Uh, do you have the slides, Marie Jose? Actually, um, I, yeah, I, I think I thought this is the last, last one. The last one in the list. Yeah, but if you look at preloaded material, I can't find them. So can you email them now, or, uh, or do you want, if you cannot trade, what is your suggestion? It's all right. Can you log in? Uh, I, I'm not I have to connect to them. I have everyone else except that one. I saw that one. Uh, well, then load them, then load them. Yeah, because I, I, I don't yeah, see I can, I can load it. Maybe I can try share the screen, my screen. He was talking to me. Take off. He was talking to me. Take off. I don't think you need the devices though, because that's going to make some echo. Okay, and if you're me, I'll advance the slides for you. I see them on the data tracker, but on the uploaded material, um, I don't see them. So you, you can ask it to reload, Mary Jose. Okay.
Are you, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, can you show your slides or would you? Yeah. So, there's my slides. Uh, this is not the screen yet. Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah. Okay. okay. You're on the uh, thing that. <laughs> so. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Chang Gang Zheng, and today I would like to talk about our uh, research related to practic practical in network classification and the lessons we've learned during the past three years. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. And I would like to talk about the lessons we've learned that during the past three years. And this work is a joint work with uh, many of our colleagues and from several different institutes, and it can be shown here. And beginning with 2019, we have be, uh, begun to do the in-network machine learning research. And at that time, we have a, a research named EASY, which also named us to switch room of machine learning. And this work has been pre presented in 2019. And it mainly demonstrates the uh, uh, mapping of trained machine learning model to programmable network devices. And uh, for that work, it mainly introduced four types of machine learning models, which is decision tree support vector machine, k-means, and knife bias. And for that work, I mainly focus on two types of target, which is BMV2 and net FPGA, SUM. And next page. And after three years, we have uh, many progress, and currently we have a work named Automating Network Machine Learning, and it provides us a planter framework that can help us to realize end-to-end -end automatic uh, uh, in-network machine learning deployment. And with this framework, we are able to automate, it, tra automate it, train the machine learning model and also generate, auto-generate the P4 file, which is different from previous work easy because P4, uh, previous work only supports static P4 file. And for the framework, it's also able to auto-generate the P4 runtime file and table entries that used for the generated P4 file. And before the real deployment of our uh, algorithm, the, the, the framework will auto uh, test and validate the design on, by using both Python and the software switch. And finally, after all this process, uh, the design will be finally auto loaded to the hardware, selected hardware. And currently, our framework support more than 12 models and uh, support more than 12 models. And it support, besides the uh, easy support for type of model, it also support, for example, decision tree. Uh, XG, a random forest, XGBoost, uh, knife base, K means, uh, an auto encoder. And, and actually, for, for, for this model, it's not all the models that we can support it. We can even support more, but we think currently it's enough for this stage. And we also generalize all these mapping solutions into encode based, lookup based, and direct mapping solutions, which can help us to uh, easily to support new type of in network machine learning algorithm. And most importantly, we support many different targets. For example, we support commodity switch ASIC, which is purely commodity switch ASIC without uh, modification. For example, Tofino and Tofino 2. And we also support, for example, targets like Puppy, which is running people programs on a Raspberry Pi. And we currently support two types of compiler on it, which is Tapas and BMV2. And we are also working on NVIDIA Spectrum and FPGA. So uh, the WIP here means working program progress process yeah the next slide so in, in this talk i would like to mainly talk about the challenges and solutions we face when we implement this in network machine learning classification algorithms and next so the first challenge that i would like to talk about is about limit number of stages and for example for the uh, commodity switch asic you really have a limit number of stage for example tofino only have 12 stages and for this figure on the left-hand side, it mainly shows the uh, typical realization of this tree model in the data plan. And we can show that uh, for each depth of the tree, it generalized into different levels. And for each level, it will consume a certain number of stages. So which means that uh, for, for the data plan program with limited number of stages, it will uh, limit the depth of the tree model to be deployed. 
And our solution is use parallelization, which means that we can parallel execute the independent functions in our network machine learning classification algorithm. And uh, yeah. And for example, for this ensemble tree models, for example, we can parallelly uh, use lookup table as feature tables. So for, for example, when feature inputs will be mapped to codes uh, for each feature. And then for the next stage, which are tree tables and these tree table also executed parallelly. And for each tree table, it will just collect the input from each uh, feature table and just output the either for the vote of this tree or the uh, probability or the depth of the tree. And in the third stage, uh, for the decision table, it will just uh, combine all the votes from previous tree tables and output the final classification result. And uh, next slide. And the second challenge that I would like to talk about is about limited memory. And for the limit memory, uh, we have two types of solution. And the first is use a more efficient mapping solution. For example, on the first figure on the left-hand side, we can see that uh, uh, compare, for, for the k-mean solution compared to, uh, for, for the easy implementation versus class stream implementation in terms of table entries consumption, we can see uh, easy solution use a static number of table entries while the class stream uh, table entry consumption increase in an order of magnitude uh, as the model depth increases. And for, in terms of the accuracy, we can find that the easy solution is independent of model depths, while the uh, class stream solution is dependent with the model depths. This is mainly because the class stream use a tree-like structure to store the table entries. Uh, well, the easy use lookup-based solution. So under these circumstances, the lookup-based solution seems more efficient. And the next solution is about using, it seems a little bit obvious, is using, uh, we can use LPM table, or ternary table, or range match table to replace the table that previously used exact match. And actually, one realized it is not as simple as it looks like, because it's not simply like using LPM in for, for IP table because the input of the maximization table of in-network machine learning classification algorithm, as I mentioned in previous slides, is for example for the tree table is a concatenated code from the feature tables. So which means that we need to use our self-designed algorithm to map the in, uh, exact match table to either lookup-based table, lookup table, uh, LPM table, ternary table, or range match table. And we can even use smart drop to further reduce the number of table entries in the, uh, in the table. So for example, we can just drop those less significant table entries. For example, there are some single sing table entries that are different from others that stop a large range of table entries from merging into a single LPM table entry. Then we can selectively re remove those table entries. And from the figure, we can find that we can reduce around uh, twenty percent of total table entries without significant influence of uh, the machine learning classification accuracy. And uh, next page. Uh, and uh, also, when implementing network machine learning classification, we should also make sure that uh, it should coexist with the normal functioning of the uh, network device. So, as shown in this framework, we have a common P four block here, which can help us to uh, generate P4 file, not only with the classification logic, but also with the use case. And this use case can be, for example, switched off P4, which is the L2, L3 reference switch. And it is designed by Intel Tofino. And this program is commonly used as a reference program uh, for in-network in computing algorithm. And actually, our uh, our, our in-network machine learning classification algorithm is parallelly executed with the normal, uh, this L2, L3 switch, and uh, it do not consume a lot of resources. So when we compare our in-network machine learning realization, model realization, uh, resource consumption of these models, we can see it's only 5% to 65% of this reference program. So which is uh, relatively small and makes it possible to coexist with the normal switch function. 
And also, we can see the latency of our in-network machine learning algorithms, and we can find that uh, if we only implement the machine learning algorithm and and it shows in the pink bar, and we can see the latency is relatively small compared to this reference program. And if we coexist with the, the machine learning algorithm with uh, uh, with this reference program, this L two L three switch, then for the for the implementable model, we can see as shown in blue bar, the level of latency is same as the standalone reference program. Yeah, next page. Next. And so no matter how we, for example, we use mapping techniques or use LPM, different types of table, uh, types of table to reduce the uh, uh, table entries to save memory, or we can do the parallelization to save stages. Still, we need to trade, uh, have, have some trade-off on uh, parameter selection when we try to use machine learning algorithm for in-network classification. And for example, for the, as we shown in this radar graph. So if we want to make sure that the uh, generate model have a same level of memory consumption, and for example, if we want to use more features, then the number of trees is, uh, and depth is limited. And if we want to have more trees, then we can only use uh, a limit number of features. And, or if we, we want to have a large number of depths, then the uh, feature and trees allowed is uh, limit. <laughs> so, uh, actually, when using this framework, actually we can play with it, and I'm not <laughs> and are you still sharing? Are you? Are you? Where is, where is Mr. Cook? Um, this is Marie Jose. Which slide are we on? Are we at slide uh, eight? Okay, I, I have them. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. So actually, when you have the framework, you can play with it and based on the use case that you select, and you can select the set of hyperparameters that best best have the best performance on your use case. And when we look at the max number of features that we are supported, for example, for the tree models, for example, decentralized attributes and random forest or random forest hybrid, we can see that if we use customized headers and we can support more than 60, for some cases, we can support more than 60 features. And if the features are stored in ASCII format inside the package, then we can support uh, only around 30 features. And if uh, it is joined implement with uh, the reference program, reference switch program, then we can only support around 15 features. And if we use a model that use different mapping techniques, for example, lookup-based solution, uh, like a model like subject machine bias and k-means, then it can only support less than 15 features. And this is also use case dependent. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> the, 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 the next slides, thank you. And also when we deploy machine learning inside the network, we should also make sure that we can update the model and we should 
do the runtime retraining and updates. And our Papier projects mainly focus on this problem and we mainly solve this problem by using digest and shadow updates. So which means that when in-network machine learning is deployed in the data plane and it will auto, uh, continue sending digest information to the uh, control plan and the control plan will collect this information and combine with existing training data and use unsupervised learning algorithm to 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 relabel this data set and it will also on server to uh, you and this generated data will be faded to the planter framework to retrain and regenerate the table entries and actually this generated table entries will be loaded to the data plan by using shadow updates so when loading this, it means we only update the table entries and we do not touch the P4 program. And by using shadow update, we can do the runtime uh, update and without interrupt its normal functioning of network function and as well as the normal functioning of classification service. And the next slide. Uh, next, next, thank you. And also, we should make sure that our in-network machine learning classification have a uh, good performance. And so this is mainly guaranteed by, the, by our design, which fits the commodity programmable switch ASIC well. So for all our design, we do not use recirculation or resubmission, and we have no control plan dependencies, and we do not use special modules like uh, customized switch ASIC. We purely use commodity switch ASIC. So this means that we can achieve a full line rate and we've, uh, we've tested on a 64 port Tofino switch and verified it. And we can also achieve sub microsecond latency and our model have same or less latency compared to the reference program also as shown in previous slides. And next slide. And uh, even though the model of in-network machine learning classification, the model size is still be limited and it's impossible, still impossible for us to implement some model like random forest with 200, 200 trees and input 200 features or with 100 depths. But what we can do is we can use hybrid deployment to uh, achieve a high inference accuracy. So which means the hybrid deployment means we deploy a small model inside the network in the data plan and we use a large model at the backend server. And in the switch, we use based on the decision confidence, we can decide if the decision is directly being made on the switch or the packet will be forward to the backend for further process. And next slides, next slides. And for example, for anomaly detection use case, uh, for the right-hand side, upper right-hand side figure, we can see if it's like the x-axis for the switch confidence threshold to be 0 0.9, so which means that the uh, decision of more than 70% of traffic can be directly made on the switch. Well, we can see that the uh, system, hybrid system accuracy in the blue line in the left-hand side figure is almost close to the baseline. So the baseline model is deployed on the server without the resource constraint. So this means that our hybrid deployment can achieve close to optimal classification result while significantly reduce the amount of traffic flowing to the backend. And the next slide. So in summary, so our work shows the in-network machine learning classification is feasible. And we can run these machine learning models on community switch with full line rate. And we are also be able to make sure that this machine learning algorithm is coexist with the use case and the normal functioning of this network device. And most of the model is scalable. And if you want to have a extremely high accuracy or very large model, then we can use hybrid deployment to deal with this problem. And we have already been uh, you explore several use cases, for example, the anomaly detection use case, the IoT gateway, smart IoT gateway, and we also uh, try the high frequency high trading use case. And we are also looking for new use cases. And if you have any ideas, we are really happy to discuss about it. So that's mainly all for this presentation. And thank you. I'm happy to take your questions. Um, thank you very much for this uh, very 
uh, interesting uh, lessons learned. Uh, any questions? Uh, I don't see anyone on the. Uh, yes, Aiki, um, please. We have somebody physically here. Yeah, that's me. Uh, so, uh, I Kunze, uh, thanks for the talk. I have a rather specific question. So, on I think on one slide you mentioned uh, that, you, uh, so with the resource consumption and all that stuff, uh, that yeah. you had like that you could implement um, more features for this one approach, then fewer features with the other approach, and then if yeah. you combined it with the switch uh, program, then you got basically on the same level for both uh, versions that you had. And there I was wondering what kind of resources or resource constraints there actually is the limiting, limiting factor. Uh, so is it then basically the uh, sequential numbers of steps that have to be executed or are there then specific con uh, constraints in, in your program that yeah, limit the number of features that you can implement? Okay, Thanks. so for the constraints. So actually for our solution of in-network machine learning algorithms, there are several types of constraints. And the most common one is uh, stage consumption. So if we increase either, for example, the number of features used or number of tree numbers, uh, I, I just used random forest as an example. If we increase the number of feature input and if we increase the uh, depth of the tree, and if we increase the number of trees, then the number of stage will increase. This is because for each stage, there is a limit amount of supported tables. If you use more than this number of tables, then it will cause an extra stage, no matter how you parallelize execute these tables. And also the memory is another constraint because uh, for example, for some of the table, for example, uh, as I mentioned in the, uh, the ensemble tree models, we can see there is a decision table and usually there, if there are too many trees and the decision table will cause loads of memory and if there are too much memory, then it will also cause extra stages. And also, uh, we can see that for for if you use customized headers for the tree models, we can support more than 60 features. But for uh, ASCII, if the feature is stored in ASCII format, then we can only support 30 features. This is because uh, the parser also have constraints, uh, resource constraints, and we cannot uh, support unlimited amount of protocols or, or headers uh, in, in the header field. So. These are the stage memory and uh, and uh, and the header uh, and parser constraint are mainly constraints for our in-network machine learning algorithms. Of course, for the general speaking of in-network machine learning classification realization, there are more constraints. For example, uh, for for most of the switches, they do not support, for example, floating point numbers, and they do not uh, support. Uh, for example, some type of mathematical operations, for example, multiplication and division operations, these are other constraints. But our solution can, can, can just do not use these operations. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> any other questions? Uh, we can send the questions on the list. Uh, I'm particularly interested, by the way, by the IoT implementation, so I'm going to read the paper for sure. Uh, thank you so we, very much. Oh, Marie Jose, we have one more question in the room. Uh, one more, okay, because the person was not on the queue. Oh, okay, uh, thank you for your good uh, presentation and your good paper. So in South Korea, we had a similar project. In that case, we uh, utilized the uh, deep learning, uh, CNN, RNN, to classify traffic, and we found it works. So I'm wondering if you handle the new uh, traffic or new feature of the traffic because, so, for example, hackers or some the, uh, bad person make some new uh, traffic for violating the network. So in this case, how can you handle the, this new traffic or new feature over data? Uh, so which type of data? I'm sorry. So, so the... you use the uh, machine learning. So it means that uh, it uh, uh, training data and find some the wisdom from existing data. So how about the new data or new feature, new traffic? So in this case, can you handle the same? Picture? Yeah, picture. Oh, picture. Uh, currently, we, uh, 
didn't test the use case with features. But generally speaking, because inside the network, the feature is not, you know, for, for it's not packet level, but flow level. Or, and also in the real use case that the, the you know, the, 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 the packet will go through different route, routing paths. So that's the reason why I didn't, we didn't touch it yet. But there is some work that I remember that using uh, Disney tree and random forest and neural network for in-network classification that uh, have some explanation about how to deal with, uh, how to do the image classification and you can try to find them. And I remember what they use is, what they currently implement is only on BMA2 environment, uh, BMA2 uh, software switch. So this is my, my understanding about the image. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, for, for uh, moving around with time. So thank you, thank you again. And uh, we'll um, make sure thank to you. follow up and, and great work. Um, Cedric, you want to sh sh share the next presentation? If you find uh, it. Uh, this is being shared. You, are you sharing? Uh, no, you're, you're sharing. Okay, I think wow, we're good it here. Works. Uh, it's, um, Ike is doing it. So just, just a quick reminder, if you want to ask questions, uh, use the Mitico uh, queue, just so that Mario Jose is managing the queue remotely. It's not done from here. So, uh, so they know who is lining up to ask questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi again. Um, I'm Ike Kunze, uh, and this is joint work with uh, Dirk and Klaus. And for those of you who have been following the research group a little bit longer. Uh, this is actually something that has come out of our uh, transport issues draft that we had uh, had at this uh, research group earlier. And what we now try to do is basically um, yeah, have a bit more thoughts on how we can actually combine or what uh, is the interplay between transport protocols, the end-to-end -end principle uh, and computing in the network. And this has resulted in a paper that we've presented last week um, at the new IP and beyond workshop. And yeah, today I would like to give you um, basically also the, the main ideas that I presented there, as well as some additional thoughts that came up in discussions there at that workshop. Um, so basically an improved version of the talk that I held uh, last week uh, in Mexico. Okay, um, I think in, in this context where we're here, uh, it's pretty easy to say that we can see that the networks are de evolving from being dumb networks to being smarter networks. Uh, previously, or in the early days, uh, we could assume that if we had a packet coming into the network, um, maybe uh, sent from host A, so this yellow packet maybe, um, that it would also come out on the other side, uh, mainly unchanged. Um, and uh, this is then often seen that the network is just a dumb pipe that forwards the packets and this is somewhat uh, encompassed in the end-to-end -end principle. And um, this is typically also used as a basis for transport protocols. So for example, uh, in TCP, when we think about the reli reliability aspects, it's simply that uh, yeah, TCP assumes that the packets are unchanged in the network. And now with COIN, this changes or this can change uh, as we can do more stuff in the network. So maybe change the color of the packets. Uh, and thus we can no longer speak of the network as being just a dumb pipe. And this also breaks then uh, assumptions for the transport layer and that we can now make changes in the network. And uh, this has already been discussed, for example, in the recent Hotnets paper. So we are not the only ones thinking about this topic. Um, but what we now try to do basically is to think about a more general uh, or have more general considerations regarding this topic. So basically, uh, what we would actually need to have a coin-enabled transport protocol that ideally also respects the end-to-end -end principle. And just to get your uh, thoughts right for this talk here, so I won't uh, provide a lot of answers, but mainly I will 
raise a lot of questions uh, that perhaps we as a research community have to uh, answer eventually. And in the following, I would first like to go back to the end-to-end -end principle, then talk a bit about a few considerations that we had, how um, such a solution or such a transport protocol looked like, uh, and then afterwards uh, also have a few more thoughts on this whole topic. So starting with the end-to-end -end principle, uh, it goes back to a paper from the 1980s. So, a bit, so the, this principle is actually older than myself. So um, probably uh, some people here in the room longer, uh, know it perhaps longer than myself. Um, and the end-to-end -end principle basically states that a function can completely and correctly only be implemented uh, with a knowledge of the end uh, of, of the applications at the endpoints. So basically saying that the endpoints have to know what's going on inside the network as well. And this is then seemingly at odds with uh, the coin, uh, with coin uh, because um, yeah, in coin we would assume that something might happen in the network. Uh, however, there's also a second sentence, actually two sentences further down in that paper, uh, which then states that an incomplete version of the function uh, can also be useful as a performance enhancement um, if it's provided by the network. Um, and now if we think about COIN as being such a performance enhancement, then this could again align uh, COIN with the end-to-end -end principle. And yeah, in this context, we then thought about or wondered a bit more about the relationship between COIN and the end-to-end -end principle. And in that context, mainly focused on two aspects. And that is first the location of computations and then as a second aspect, what kind of computations can actually be performed. And regarding the location, um, I think there, uh, even in this room, if I would ask you what kind of computations would you consider to be coin computations, I would get probably, let's see, maybe 30 different answers probably. Um, so a strict definition of coin would be that we can, for example, only compute uh, or perform computations on networking devices, so really on switch hardware, uh, basically as we've seen in the previous presentation, for example. Uh, however, there are also more uh, free definitions of coin, so basically seeing coin as a subset of edge computing or cloud computing, um, maybe only enriched with additional functionality in the network, um, but basically having some computations between the hosts, uh, between the end hosts. And um, in our paper, we actually try to get around uh, making a strong statement at this point and basically just uh, generalized to uh, coin elements. So just saying, okay, we now consider any capability that we have there between the endpoints as a coin element. And yeah, it's up for anyone else to decide what exactly is now coin or not. Um, what we did distinguish though is um, where we perform the computations, so with relation to the endpoints. Um, so here we have in red the um, typical or the fast end-to-end -end path, uh, and we then distinguish between two types of computations. Uh, one are on-path coin elements, so directly on this um, shortest path, for example, and the other computations would be off-path coin elements where we then would need to reroute the packet or where the packets would need to take a, uh, to take a slight detour. Then as a second aspect, we thought about what kind of functionality can now be provided by the networking device or by the coin elements. Um, and here we took a rather functional view, I would say. Um, so also stemming from the end-to-end -end argument where uh, Salt et al were always talking about the function that is provided. And here in this example, we have a function uh, capital F um, consisting of a few sub-functions that is computed between host A and host B. And we then thought about what kind of functionality can now be provided uh, by the coin element in the middle. And the first option would be, for example, uh, an F1 prime functionality, so an incomplete version of the original function, and then maybe also a bit uh, tweaked so that it can actually be, per be performed here on the coin element. And as this is now still part of the end-to-end -end functionality, uh, we call this an end-to-end -end function internal computation. So basically, we have a functionality that was originally part of the function, and we can now also place it in a, on the coin element. And then the other alternative would be to have a function that is not part of the original functionality, and this then here uh, symbolized as a function G. Um, and here we were then, uh, and 
we call this a function, end-to-end uh, -end function external computation. And here we, we were then wondering whether this is then still something that we would like uh, or that can be end-to-end -end compliant or not. And here we thought that if we now place a new functionality um, into the network, then this is rather uh, having a new endpoint in this overall functionality. And thus we think that this is rather some form of edge computing or cloud computing, but not really coin, at least if we want to um, ensure the end-to-end uh, -end, uh, principle compliant variant of coin. And with that being said, let me quickly summarize these two aspects. So what we think can be end-to-end -end compliant coin computations are end-to-end -end function internal computations that we can then either place on on or off path coin elements. And in the following, um, we then thought about how and where we could actually place such functionality. Uh, because right now I've only discussed a bit about the general aspects regarding these things, but not uh, how we would actually practically use this stuff. And there we basically came up with two design principle, uh, principles as we call them. And the first one is regarding the location where we can place it. So considering we have here two locations um, where we could place functionality. So we have uh, F1 prime and F1 double prime. And then the question is, do we use F1 prime or do we use F1 double prime? And the first two aspects that we here considered are rather straightforward, I would say. Um, so we think that if we use additional coin functionality, then we should still adhere to the original requirements of the functionality. So basically don't break anything that has been working before. And then as a second aspect, and that basically now um, belongs to the second part of the end-to-end -end principle that I mentioned earlier, we also think that it should then also enrich the original functionality. But then we could still have the case that both of these function placements that we have um, would, um, yeah, be valid for bo both of these aspects. And then we thought about what kind of tiebreaker could we have there or how we could then actually um, derive the decision that we want to have. And for um, the inspiration, we then looked at the simplicity principle, which basically states that we should always thrive to the uh, simplest solution or always try to reduce complexity as much as possible. And we then basically translated this into um, that the the coin functionality should optimize functional complexity against a key communication requirement. Okay, fancy words. What do we actually mean with that? Um, so if we have now here these two, um, two, two functions and we then, for example, consider the latency as key communication requirement, then we would, uh, for example, use the lower functionality if it's possible to deploy um, the function that we need there. Um, because in that case, we would, uh, if we consider that the rerouting to the upper function would take a little bit longer time, um, then we would have the lower latency at the lower path and thus would choose this location. However, if the functionality is too large for this lower functional, uh, functional deployment, then we would take the upper path. And so we think that this is at least the starting point uh, which people can uh, build upon to, uh, to consider where we can place functionality. We then also had a different um, view on this whole topic, um, basically regarding the first part of the end-to-end -end principle, so the knowledge of the endpoints. Um, and here we again have the uh, overall functionality F, and now we place a new functionality in the network, so it's also an incomplete version of the function. Uh, but we place it there without the knowledge of the endpoints. And in this case, it could very well introduce a lot of problems because now the endpoints are still computing the whole functionality, but there in the network, we also compute something of the functionality and then stuff can break. Uh, and I think uh, performance enhancing proxies, for example, are an example where um, placing something in between the end hosts without the knowledge of the end hosts, um, yeah which is an example where this has caused problems before. And thus we think that a second design principle in this context would be that we should always insert the coin functionality uh, in, transparency, in full transparency to the endpoints so that they know that something's going on uh, in between them. And with these design principles then also in mind, we then thought about 
considerations for the transport protocol. Obviously, mainly coming from our previous work that we collected here in the context of this research group. Um, and why did we actually choose uh, the transport protocol? Well, it's a function that is traditionally implemented in the endpoints only. And it's also the one layer that is uh, translating from the network to the applications. So it will also be the layer that is affected by any changes that we have uh, induced, that are induced in the network. And in this context, we then uh, considered several aspects. So in this paper, we focused on addressing. So basically, how can we choose which function or computations uh, to execute in the network? Um, as a second part, flow granularity. Um, so deciding, do we need a stream notion as, for example, in TCP, or are we um, okay with a datagram notion as in UDP? And then finally, also more evolved communication concepts like collective communication. So basically not only having two endpoints in the communication, but a few more of them. And for today, I would like, or yeah, for today, I would like to focus on the addressing part. And if you're interested in more details on those three aspects, uh, have a look at our paper. I will also have the QR code in the end, so um, you can scan it then. Uh, and also we have still our now expired draft where we even consider more aspects than only uh, those three. Okay, then starting with the addressing. Um, so typically, even if a host A wanted to communicate with a host B, we then add basically some kind of tag to the packet uh, in the form of an IP address and a transport, a transport protocol port to address a specific application. Um, and now the question is, how can we do this if we want to have a function F1 prime somewhere in the network? And the first option that we have is some form of implicit integration. So we actually don't really um, address it explicitly, but just place the functionality somewhere in the network. So in this case, we would uh, try to guess maybe where the packets will go and then place the functionality strategically on this device so that the packets will actually be processed by that computation. Um, so this works in a lot of cases, especially in smaller networks. It's actually also something that is typically used for research uh, prototypes. So I've done that myself in a quite a lot of projects. Um, however, if we now scale up the networks, then at some point this becomes really hard to maintain. And especially in some networks, we don't even know where packets really go. And thus it's really tricky to do, this, to do it this way. And additionally, it also only allows for the on-path notion uh, of coin as we yeah, just place the functionality on path. So off path is not possible. Um, yeah, the second option is then an explicit steering mechanism. So here we then really uh, apply some kind of tag to the packet to, for example, say, okay, we would, have, we would like to have the F1 prime functionality up there. Um, and in this case, we would then also have the off path notion. Uh, however, uh, it's really unclear how we would actually like to do this uh, addressing. And I will come to a few uh, possible solutions later on as well. Um, but this is then really something that we, we need to think about uh, how we would like to implement this. Um, and then assuming that we have some form of addressing, um, so mainly perhaps focusing on the explicit addressing for a moment, uh, if we then have two different um, locations where we have functionality, then we would might want to decide which kind of uh, these, or which of these two functions we would like to execute. And um, there then the question is, how would we like to do this? So would we like to always specify the exact location? So for example, say, okay, we would like to have the upper F1 prime functionality. Uh, do we only specify some kind of constraints? So for example, saying we would like to have the one with the lower latency or with other requirements. Um, or can't we as an end host uh, do anything about it, but just let the network handle it and the network decides uh, which function is selected. Um, so there's really, I think, a large spectrum of possible solutions or um, answers to these questions. Um, so as I said, we mainly raise questions and don't answer them. So quite a lot of them here. And then if we have some form of instance selection mechanism, then we might also want to keep affinity to those um, instances. Because for example, if we would like to build up a certain level of state at some point, yeah, then we would always want to go to the same um, service instance at that point. And here then the question is, how do we actually realize uh, this affinity? Uh, do we set that up already during an orchestration phase before we actually have the first computation? Is this done on the fly? 
Um, so again, a lot of questions that arise here. And I think in the paper we uh, raise even more of them. So if you would like to read a lot of questions or get a lot of uh, yeah, ideas for questions, then have a look at the paper. Yeah, then maybe trying to summarize this a bit. Um, we also had a look at existing solutions uh, because obviously there's a lot of internet technology already out there that might be applicable to, uh, to these problems. Um, and one uh, is, for example, the source routing. So here we can, as an end host, already um, define which path we would like Packet to take through a network. However, it is not directly something that we can use for defining the functionality. So for example, considering that we might have different functions on one device, uh, that we would need yeah, multiple IP addresses, for example, for each of the functions that we have, um, which might become quite a lot. Uh, however, there are service function chaining, which allows already for steering traffic th through functions. Um, so if we now interpret coin as some form of network function or service function, then this might be applicable. Uh, and similarly, we have information centered networking as well, where um, we now address information rather than endpoints. And thus, again, if we now interpret coin as some form of information, then this, th these might also be uh, applicable. Um, concepts. So overall, uh, I would say there are many possible solutions to the many questions that we've raised. Uh, but I think, um, yeah, these questions are still open. So we haven't provided any concrete answers for that. Um, and I think the main takeaway from our paper is that there are ways in which coin can be aligned with the end-to-end -end principle. Um, but we then have to really carefully think about what solutions we actually pick for all the questions uh, that we've raised. So, and this is the part that was basically the same last week uh, as well uh, at the um, UIP and Beyond workshop. And now maybe something more provocative that uh, was discussed in the context of that workshop. Um, so there were actually also, or was an other talk there as well. So um, this Tintin um, protocol, um, and we then thought about um, yeah, how would you actually um, do this in practice now? So we've raised a lot of questions regarding transport protocols, um, but we now see already that there are two rather specialized protocols. And the question that we then discussed was, yeah, do we now want to have one global protocol that basically solves the end-to-end -end principle problems of COIN? Um, so basically having yeah, the one transport protocol that we need for all the applications? Or do we rather have a lot of specialized protocols for different limited domains? Um, do we then have perhaps a couple of core features? So basically a core protocol that we then uh, extend for the different specialized domains that we have there. Do these protocols then have some way of interacting that is perhaps standardized or do each of these protocols really only apply to their specific limited domain? And then maybe now as a really provocative last question, um, might it be also be possible to somewhat abandon the end-to-end -end principle in these limited domains? Because after all, if we, for example, think about industrial networks, then we have basically that the whole network is in the, um, yeah, in the premise of one entity. And so we could already think that basically this end-to-end -end principle aspect is already covered because if someone deploys solutions there, then they basically are the endpoints as well as the network. Um, so yeah, really trying to be a bit provocative maybe here in the end to uh, yeah, inspire some thoughts and arguments uh, on, these all, on all of these topics. And with that, I would now like to wrap it up. Uh, so in the beginning, I showed you why uh, many people think that coin is at odds with the end-to-end -end principle. Uh, but then I hope that I've shown you a way or an, uh, way of thinking about it, um, how we can align these things again. Um, so with the end-to-end -end function internal computations, both on on and off path coin elements. Um, we then talked about two design principles for coin. And then finally, uh, I had a brief discussion about considerations, at least for the addressing part. And as promised, here are the two QR codes. And now I thank you a lot for your attention. and. I'm happy to have uh, a discussion with you or to hear your comments on this. Thanks.
Thank you. Um, you raised a lot of the questions that uh, we've asked ourselves in the past uh, few years. There's three people on the, um, uh, actually now four people on the queue. Dirk, you want to start? Yes, my pleasure. Um, hey, Ike, um, nice presentation. Um, you are raising many um, questions here. I think this is a um, very comprehensive approach that you um, uh, present here. And um, I was thinking you are probably making your life unnecessarily hard. So, um, so the question, so you know, how should you design this or what should be the services by certain protocol really depends a lot on what you want to do. And um, I think it's really hard right now to, um, you know, um, conceive and um, hypothetical, um, you know, coin protocol without actually knowing what you want to do. And um, so this, the end-to-end -end principle discussion is a good example for that. So, um, I mean, these principles were um, formulated with, with a certain goal. And um, so they may not necessarily be the same goals that you have when you think about computing in the network. So when your objective is to build an internet work based on packet switching and statistical multiplexing, um, yeah, then you need to think about um, um, the, the um, control power of the end systems. Um, so and to enable different kinds of applications, transport functions, and so on. And um, so this is a model that fits very well to the internet and to IP and so on. But for computing in the network, um, so we don't necessarily um, um, have the same goal. And that means we don't necessarily have to um, constrain ourselves by, by these principles. So just one example, um, you could say conceive um, something like a protocol for, for computing in the network like a data flow system where you connect um, functions and each, fu each function does something, produces uh, new data and so on. Um, that would be, of course, very much at odds with this with the end-to-end -end principle, but uh, sometimes it's just what you need. And um, so um, I, I think we, we, it's probably a bit um, too much or maybe also premature to think about um, like the, the grand uh, unifying uh, computing in the network protocol um, for all kinds of applications. I think this needs to come from experience um, or yeah, on experiments for, um, especially in different areas. And then you could think about, um, so what does use case A need, use case B and so on. And um, is there a need at all for an internet level protocol? That's another question. Yeah, uh, thanks for the uh, for your thoughts on this. Uh, so actually, our uh, goals were not to have this one unified protocol, but we just try to basically, as you said, uh, without having a lot of practical experience in the large scale deployment of these things, um, to think about from our standpoint of today, how we could actually align these aspects, um, maybe also to um, yeah, give a lot, a, a bit of guidance, maybe for the first larger deployments of uh, solutions like that, um, so that we can then afterwards, maybe in a few years, uh, come back to these considerations and then think about whether they actually made sense um, or whether we actually need such a large scale protocol. And this was actually then ma maybe also why we had these discussions that I presented on the second to last slide. Um, so do we even need this large scale protocol or are we fine with having uh, specialized protocols for specific applications? Because um, those two papers that I referenced there, they actually provide solutions for specific problems um, and they, I think, um, yeah, solve them quite well and could be used as a, a first step towards this uh, direction already. Yeah, thanks. Um, maybe just, just quickly, um, um, I think it's also a question of how you frame this problem. Um, so if you have the mental model of, say, getting data from one end to the other and then doing some computation in the middle, um, this may give you some kind of 
TCP-like framing or something. Um, I'm not sure that's, that's uh, necessarily the best, um, say, mental model for thinking about computing in the network. Um, so again, thinking about like data flow systems where um, you, it's not about you know carrying bits with some modification in the middle from from one into the other. It's more like you are you having like discrete steps of computation, and each step produces something completely different. And um, so maybe then this 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 whole connection or transport um, metaphor is not not exactly helpful. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thanks. Um, next in the line is, is Roland. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, I, I like the approach to, to try to think about how to maybe more align with the end-to-end -end argument. Um, to me, the end-to-end -end argument has, has basically two advantages. If you apply it, one is the robustness because you have less, less functionality inside the network. So one aspect is maybe to think about how those partial functions influence or may influence each other. So that, that could be, I mean, there could be some kind of interdependencies or side effects that should be avoided. I don't, I, I didn't read your draft and, and, and all your work. So that's kind of new to me. Um, so maybe you, you discussed that already. Uh, the other thing is innovation, uh, protection of innovation or, I mean, the, the argument is, is it, it's hard to change the network. And when we have functionality in place that allows that like P4 and what have you, um, that's maybe not the, let's say, obstacle anymore uh, that it, 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 when, when it was uh, the time of writing the end-to-end -end argument. Or, um, but robustness is the th thing we should care about. And uh, so it would be good to, to think along the lines, um, trying to, to not break things. Uh, one more observation, uh, when you were talking about uh, addressing, I think it complicates things a lot if you require applications to have knowledge about your network. So one thing is that the network tries to figure out what's, um, what should be done uh, in, in order to support the application. But another aspect would be to, to require that the application has uh, some, some knowledge of uh, where to locate the functions or where to invoke the functions. And I think this is maybe not the good direction to do that, right? Because it makes things more complex. And I can remember discussions here in the IGF where the application developers said, um, please, um, no, don't do that. Yeah, thanks a lot of, uh, so that's a, a lot of uh, interesting thoughts. Uh, maybe to quickly answer to a few of them. Uh, so regarding the, the robustness aspects or the interaction between the functions, uh, I'm not sure if we have actually included it in the paper, but at least in the draft, we discussed stuff about this. Um, so for example, regarding um, Retrans, so basically having retransmission, or if we would like to have some kind of re reliability maybe, um, how would we then handle, for example, if we have two or three functions and then the packet get lost, gets lost after the second function and we've already changed state in the first and second function maybe, how can we actually handle this? Um, so we have at least, I think, discussed these problems uh, uh, in essence and as I already said, we mainly raise questions and not pro don't provide m much answers, but that's a very valid point. Um, and then... Yeah, I actually have lost the track of the other aspects, but maybe we can discuss that also offline. Later. Yeah, the other aspect was uh, addressing and requiring applications to have knowledge about uh, functional support in the network, which yeah. complicates application writing and, and makes yeah, it exactly complex that. also on the other side, not only complex in the networks on the network side, but also on the other side. Yeah, exactly. That's why we've basically discussed these different uh, possibilities that we have there. Um, and I think the, so at least the uh, source routing aspect would would require knowledge by the endpoints to route it through there, while the, um, yeah, if we 
do the the information centric networking aspect maybe and only know we would like to have this functionality then this would of course then again reduce the the complexity so of course there are different that's why i said we have different solutions and we now have to think about which we would actually uh, like to deploy uh, but i think your considerations there are really helpful in that context um we have two more people in the queue uh lars Oh, it's Lars, it's, let me jump in. This is Andy Reid. I'm sorry, I couldn't work out how to raise a hand on the on-site on on tool. Uh, firstly, thank you very much. A very interesting paper. And I think the connection between the transparency of the end-to-end -end principle and addressing seems to be a really central issue. And it's very similar to some of the aspects that we addressed in the paper we presented at last IRTF. I'd be very happy to, very keen to develop that further. I think we started from a slightly different start point but came to some fairly similar conclusions. Uh, and I think understanding how you define your addressing and how you define your transparency is particularly important. And I think if we develop that idea both potential getting some real clarity on what in network compute actually means. Thank yeah, you. definitely. Yeah, let's discuss this then offline or later on. Hi, so um, Lars Eggard. Lars. Um, first, yes, public service announcement. If you want to be in this room, you got to wear a mask. You got to wear it over your mouth and nose, and it's got to be an FFP2, N95, or better mask. If you don't want to comply, you can leave the room and join the session from your hotel room or somewhere else. So please comply. I know everybody's ears are falling off. I know it's not consistent with what's happening outside the session, but it is the community consensus that this is the policy that we have. So thanks for complying and uh, provide input for the next consultation, what we're going to do of mass. That said, nice talk. Thank you. Um, I have sort of two points that sort of correlate to the two parts you had in your in your um, slide. So, so our crow company and and we do uh, you know the, the very early stages of of coin. Right, we put stuff on FPGAs and we're thinking about what might we want to put further into the network. And so, the outline you had in the beginning about the end-to-end -end principle sort of matched sort of what I thought intuitively, but I hadn't really written it down or thought about it sort of formally in, in a structured way. So that was very useful. Thank you. I think you got something there. Um, that that makes sense. So, so, so think further in that direction. Very good. Um, and second, on the transport protocol side. So again, from the sort of practical view that, you know, one, I want to put stuff that's expensive on the CPU somewhere else where it's cheaper. Um, so I want to do the minimal thing um, to make my current workload, my current application faster. That means like I'm not, I don't want to bother with new protocols. I don't want to like, I want, I want to put stuff that costs me money now and put it somewhere where it's cheaper and have everything else be the same. And specifically, I want to do it for stuff that is sort of internet related, right? So, so the more you change and the more it becomes custom, although it might be optimized in some way, the harder it gets for me to actually start doing this. And so, so since this is the IRTF, which is close to the IETF, I would sort of encourage people to maybe think about the low hanging fruit that is sort of easy to get to provide a bunch of benefit already and that sort of move us into that direction where later on we might be able to pick up some things. I do understand this research. I do anything that's where the hard problems are that lets you publish papers, so excellent. But for sort of us here that try to think about the IETF, the things that we can deploy soon are much more interesting to me. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Eric Nordmark, yeah, I really like the, 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 the last, sort of going. I would say last but not least. Oh. Yeah, Eric Nordmark. So I really like sort of going back and thinking about the stuff in terms of what, what are the implications and sort of framing it the way we've done it. One thing I didn't see here, which ties into robustness, is this notion, the, the issues around state in the network, right? And, and the sort of fate sharing aspects we have when all of the session transport related state lives at the endpoints. Um, so it might be useful to, to, to add that to the sort of list of things to consider in this picture. You raised an interesting question about sort of a, a common transport protocol, whatever that means in the co this context, right? As opposed to something specific. I think we already have examples where people are proposing things that 
you might argue are not really compute, but there's this thing, things called in, in-band, inline OAM, where your compute is just extracting state from the, the routers as you pass through them, right? So you can actually now measure things in more interesting ways. But, but it's sort of, we have that at one end, we have ICN at the other end, right? Uh, you, what, what are the things, what is, from a research perspective, sort of ignoring Lars, you know, we would like to deploy something tomorrow, but, but you know, what's the sort of spectrum over there, right? Uh, I think that's something that's interesting to consider, continue to explore. So. Yeah, thanks a lot for your comment. Uh, so, um, yeah, there is a lot of, uh, or a large spectrum of possible solutions. So from something with only minor tweaks maybe and deploy it tomorrow to having something really brand new and taking a lot of years to, to deploy. Um, so really interesting to see where this will go. Perhaps uh, we will need more uh, practical experience first, as uh, Dirk mentioned in this in the first question, uh, and then regarding the robustness as, uh, aspect, as I said to uh, Roland's question earlier. Uh, I think we have some discussions on that in, in the draft. I'm not sure if we had discussions about state, but we had at least had it on, in our mind when we wrote about it, uh, about this stuff. Uh, so it was there, um, but yeah, also definitely something that we need to consider uh, when deploying uh, things in these directions. Yeah, so thanks again for the for the comment, for questions, or both. Okay, um, so for sake of time, we'll go to the uh, distributed ledger. Thank you very much, uh, Ike and uh, and and Dirk also, who was part of this. Um, so yes. Um, Next presentation. Um, it's Cedric, remote, you want right? to load them or you want me to load them? Uh, can, can, work, the speaker is not here, so it's, is it remote or? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm talking today. Hi, everybody. I'm David and, uh, or David. David, can you share the slides or you want me to uh, emerge it to share? Uh, I, I, I will actually do it. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Um, so uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, attending the session. So I'm talking today about insights on the impact of the ELTs in provided networks. It's a joint work with Derek Tross and Mike McBride and Shin Fan. Shin Shin. Um, next slide, please. So we have been working before already. So we published in this IAC white paper um, some some related material. We started with a simple experiment trying to measure how was uh, uh, the DLTs behaving in our internet. We realized a sort of a passive measurement. We did some basic analysis, and we also wrote a, a, this draft that is is published there. And the upcoming paper has a little bit more analytical and structured analysis. We compare with the studies and is about to be published. Next slide, please. Um, so for sort of understanding on a high level, um, how these permissionless distributed consensus systems are thought and uh, how the designers thought about this, how to approach the permissionless approach. They take basically the so-called distributed hash tables that um, are nothing else that a place where, uh, where files are, they host and receive content. And the goal for these distributed hash tables was um, in the beginning for, to decentralize and distribute a file system, a network file system in a permissionless fashion over a faulty network. Then over these um, network files, someone can agree on the status in a state machine. So the goal here on the distributed consensus systems is to decentralize a distributed uh, state machine in a permissionless fashion as well over a faulty network. And after that, it came the distributed ledger technology that is nothing else than a consensus-oriented system that is agree on distributed content. Uh, it resembles a voting system, and it often uh, executes a consensus on a replicated ledger, and currently is built over internet scale based on peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, so uh, next slide, please. 
We identify in these systems um, these three basic interactions, we call it DLT service interactions, where a client, for example, commits a transaction or a request to the distributed consensus system, the miner on another peer can commit or uh, found block, um, or the truth uh, as a voter in the distributed consensus system using previously discovered clients. And any client at the end can read the block. How these interactions are realized? And next slide, please. Um, actually, we identify a key mechanism to realize these interactions. It's the so-called atomic broadcast. And for the case of these large scale system, this atomic broadcast is randomized over a set of receivers, mainly to avoid possible collision of parts of a stable receiver set and to ensure distribution of ledger information across all over all, all over the peers over the time. It copes with the permissionless um, approach, but also deals with the scale nature of this uh, distributed system and is built, as said before, as a peer-to-peer -peer system on top of IP networks using UDP, TCP, and QUIC. Next slide, please. We identify in um, these build systems, these communication patterns, and we notice in the left hand side, for example, we um, identified the discovery part of the protocol, and on the right hand side, the pool establishment uh, a part of the protocol. The pool is necessary to uh, execute the randomized broadcast, as said before, that is the key core mechanism to diffuse information over the entire system to agree on the state of the of the of the system and the discovery part starts with a load of bootstrap nodes from a list of DLT peers that is hosted on a specific um, IP addresses all around the world. We randomize this list and we try to contact them executing uh, UDP ping and pong so we identify which uh, peers are reachable and which ones are not. And to the ones that were reachable, we sent um, queries to request more, more nodes. With these uh, nodes, we again randomize um, this list of uh, DLT peers to establish uh, upper layer communication, um, something based on TCP transport security. We execute capability exchange and we end up adding this peer uh, to the pool that we are going to use for executing uh, broadcast or try to execute uh, broadcast in the entire system. Next slide, please. So what is challenging, what is challenging about this? Um, we identify mainly a cost for pool maintenance, for example. Uh, peers need, as I said before, to continuously establish and maintain this reachability information to discover new peers and to send information about uh, the latest state of the blockchain. Um, each peer needs to maintain uh, constantly changing this pool, so it means that it's always constantly uh, changing information about signatures, uh, TLS, TCP, and um, session in general. Um, we identify also cost for resilience and reliability, um, how the failing nodes are causing latency on the pool establishments, hence is um, also delaying the distributed consensus and for the case of TCS and content retrieval for the case of, of uh, distributed hash tables. Um, we also identified the timeouts that are inducing removal of peers and that causing uh, the replenishing of the pool. As well, we identified that matching capabilities in, in these peers at the scale is very costly. Um, and we as well um, identified the unicast replication uh, for the DLT to work. And as well as um, some issues with the IP address privacy, because when you try to join these networks, your IP address is exposed to the entire system. Next slide, please. So we set up um, um, a, a scale um, uh, experiment and we classify the peers that we look, we compare, and we also identify some geographical distribution, we identify some centrality things, but for today we are exposing more network-oriented results and we will start with pool establishment.
time. This is the time that a single peer from a local computer will uh, use to build the pool of peers that is willing to broadcast information to. So uh, in the first plot on the left, we uh, identify for a single sample how long did it take to um, yeah, uh, to, uh, to complete the pool establishment why we um, um, and we identified uh, the one third of the, the, num the total number of the pools at TN over three and we identified this as a single random variable and we analyze uh, over the entire experiment uh, reaching this um, probability distribution. We compare and approximate with a log normal scale and with a uh, power law distribution for the two random variables. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, why this time is um, so, so sort of huge? Uh, and what are the components we try to analyze from the point of view of identifying what is happening to this cover a peer? Uh, for outgoing and for incoming requests, as shown in the plot, for example, um, on the left side, we identify the number of attempts that our node tries to execute over the internet. Out of these, how many were reachable, that is in the purple line, and out of these, how many discovery and attempts I executed, and how many success we got for outgoing and for incoming requests. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, after we discover the peers that we want to communicate, or we are willing to communicate with, we um, start by executing an attempt of TCP um, socket initialization, and that's plotted on the, for outgoing request on the left hand side as a red curve. Out of these, for example, we we were not successful in a certain number of transport security uh, negotiation or a capability checkpoint or capability protocol. This capability protocol, for example, is an upper layer uh, protocol for Ethereum that it requires to run in a specific version. Or the checkpoint uh, makes reference to, for example, the latest block that was agreed in the entire system. Uh, next slide, please. So we were thinking, uh, so with these observations, um, like for example, that miners provide a service capability to others miners, um, the communication is some sort of constrained. And so we need to negotiate uh, TLS capabilities, certain sort of hardware, and we need to identify the blockchain checkpoint to, um, to get the right miners. Um, and what is, more is this group of peers are instantaneously randomized to ensure protection against collusion or what is so-called eclipse attacks. Um, so um, the put creation is done at uh, every peer and is the core mechanism to enable this, this operation, trying to execute a broadcast to the entire system based on unicast operations. These, um, these operations is done on a fixed group size and is identified, is defined through a heuristic. Uh, there are some theoretical bounds and that are this heuristic based on uh, to define when the system is going to converge and when it's not going to converge. So can the network help with these, um, with these uh, observations? Next slide, please. Um, so we think, for example, that um, no, the previous slide, yeah, um, uh, that programmable in network compute capabilities can help with realizing some uh, some of these aspects that I just showed. Like, for example, use a service centric abstraction um, where miners are service instances to DLT to a TLT service, the routes become a pool of service instances to enable instantaneous randomization uh, on the endpoint. Um, the reachability can be improved through uh, the encoded constraints or in, in, in a naming structure, and we can replace the randomized unicast with a forward 
multicast capability that is built in the network for a fixed side of, of, of peers. Um, we can ensure as well that every request leads to a randomized set of peers, uh, which excludes the use of IP multicast. Um, some thoughts are very welcome, some, some questions as well. I'm happy to discuss and take your questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, if not, actually, we're getting late. So uh, maybe we want to move to uh, the next presentation, which I'm going to uh, load right now. Um, I think it's early now. Uh, do we have, yes, we have Pascal Ouzon, so there we go, uh, Pascal, please. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, I am Pascal Ouzon from Telecom Paris, which is a kind of, uh, we call it, what we call in France, in Saclay. And so, uh, the subject of this talk is a presentation of uh, this uh, draft which is called uh, IOSC, and IOSC stands for Internet of Secure Elements. And it is an architecture of uh, secure elements in the Internet uh, whose uh, resources are identified by uh, URI. So next slide, please. Or oh, okay, I can't can control it. I don't know. Uh, so two words about secure elements. Uh, secure elements contain certified microcontrollers and uh, embedded uh, software. So they have a height evaluation assurance uh, level up to uh, EL6+, plus, given a square ranging from 1 to, 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 to 7, according to common criteria. So you all know secure elements because uh, secure elements are used in a, a bank card, a SIM card, e-passport, and so on. So there are a lot of secure elements produced every year, so 9 billion uh, last year. And they are small CPU with a very modest quantity of uh, SRAM and uh, non-volatile uh, memory. Uh, there is the next generation, and in the next generation, uh, you have uh, more uh, RAM and uh, more flash. And it's important to notice that all the chip include the uh, crypto processor. So it means uh, they have uh, modest computing resources, but they are able to compute uh, usual uh, cryptography with uh, accepting, uh, acceptable uh, performance. Uh, le legacy communication uses a serial interface uh, normalized by ISO 7816 standard, but you can find uh, a to A2C interface or uh, SPI interface. Uh, they uh, exchange a small packet, uh, which are named uh, APDU by ISO 7816. The small packets means about uh, 256 bytes. They have op open uh, programming environment. Uh, for example, Java card, uh, 6 billion uh, Java card are produced every year. Uh, deploy every year. Let's say that most of SIM card, for example, uh, use uh, Java card environment. It means that you can uh, write pro program uh, in the Java card language, which is a subset of Java, or you can another environment use uh, usual lang pro programming language like, 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 like C and so on. And at last, but not at least, uh, there are um, secure software ma ma management framework, which is uh, standardized by the Global Platform Consortium. And that is supported by quite all secure element. And this is used to list, uh, delete, uh, and uh, upload uh, application in uh, secure element. For example, mobile operator use over the air technique in order to download application in, uh, in SIM card. So, next slide, please. Uh, so, in, in, in this draft, we want to connect uh, secure element to Internet. And uh, why we want to do that? We want to deploy uh, online uh, tristograph trusted cryptographic resources for internet uh, you, you, user. The idea is, uh, well, when, when you need to, to store some key or cryptographic uh, 
re resource in an offline mode, you may use a secure element. And so it may be useful for internet users to have the same level of trust, but for online uh, resource. And so we want to identify these resources by uh, uniform resource identifiers. The issue is that uh, obviously we will need an additional processors to, to do that with uh, network interface and TCP/IP co-connectivity. Uh, we need to support global platform for on-demand application. It's not mandatory because you can uh, use a pre-loaded application. But uh, for on-demand application, uh, infrastructure, the user will ask the provider to download a new application in a secure element. So we, we need this, this support. Uh, we need a protocol to access to secure element uh, re -re resources. And in this draft, we, we, we choose uh, basically TLS as a protocol for user interface, service interface. We need to define secure element naming in order to identify this uh, secure element over internet. And uh, we need an attestation procedure for on-demand application. The goal of attestation procedure is to give uh, the user a uh, sufficient level of, of trust that uh, is uh, really using uh, the secure element. He believes it is using with uh, the right application inside and the right uh, hardware pro provider. So next slide, please. So in IOSC draft, uh, you see the, the, the kind of uniform uh, resource identifier. Uh, so the secure element is identified by a name, TLS server name, which is called SEN. Uh, it uses at this moment uh, pressure key, that's to say a symmetric C -C 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 secret is associated to a server name and, uh, and port. And uh, according to a given scheme, uh, in current uh, GitHub uh, open application, we use simply a uh, command line, an ASCII co command line. It's a kind of shell, uh, which is secured by a TLS. And according to this scheme, we send a query to the secure element and get the, the, the response. So in the draft, the IOC server component at first for administration plane, uh, the protocol called RAX, which was designed, let's say, uh, a few years ago, and which uh, used a TCP daemon. Uh, for the server plane, we use a TLS uh, for secure element, which is TLS uh, server 1.3 with uh, pre share key and, uh, and DF Hellman exchange for, for computing uh, the share secret. And uh, this uses also a TCP daemon. And the attestation uh, procedures. Uh, make the staff need to transfer uh, the element control to to, to user. So it relies on uh, two properties. First, uh, secure element cannot be cloned. And second, they manage uh, only one uh, TLS session at a given time. So next slide, please. Uh, so this is a short uh, review of uh, the administration plane. So RAX basically is something that works over uh, TLS using uh, certificate, both for server and client. It's been it's a PKI, uh, it's a PKI uh, model. And so RAX uh, is able to transport uh, ISO uh, 7816 uh, packet. And uh, in order to and use something called secure element identifier, which can be, for example, a slot, a physical slot, on a, an I2C address or a name. And uh, because the uh, RAX transport uh, ISO 7816 with uh, policy access, uh, it is able to uh, transport a global platform uh, protocol. And uh, so it is able to, uh, to, to, to perform uh, uh, the delete and upload uh, application operation in, uh, in secure elements. And so next slide, please. For on the service plane, uh, we use something called the TLS for secure elements. That to say a particular profile of TLS server at this moment you using a pre pre pusher key and a server name a TLS a server name we put uh, the server name uh, in a field called uh, answer to request 
uh, which is obtained when you reset when you reset physically on the re when you use the, the reset pin on a secure element you collect some things called an answer to request and uh, there are some api to to put uh, in this answer to request you have something called historical bytes up to 15 bytes and uh, you have some apis that enable you to put whatever you want in the historical byte. so really at this physical level uh, we put uh, the server name and so after we define an interface to transport TLS packet over ISO 7816 uh, interface so there is a client uh, facing server and this client facing server according to uh, service name indication finds the client hello uh, the server name of uh, the backend says the server and so if uh, this server is present, the secure element is present on, uh, on the system, afterwards it route uh, incoming and outgoing packet to and from this uh, TLS uh, backend uh, server. And uh, on the client side, uh, you can uh, to, to access, so on the client side, as you see on this uh, diagram, uh, everything is based on TLS and TCP. It means there is no, it's pure uh, network interface. And you may use some identity module in order to compute the procedure uh, re re required by the uh, pressure key uh, used in uh, TLS, but it is not uh, uh, mandatory. So uh, next slide, please. And uh, finally, this is the on-demand application illustration and uh, attestation. Sorry. So you, you see on on, uh, on the on the left, you have the application provider, and on the right, uh, the user. And uh, in the middle, the IOSC server, which is the infrastructure that uh, all the set of secure elements. So first, uh, the application provider use racks to download application in the secure elements. And then it binds uh, the secure element name to the secure element identifier. And uh, at this step, as a secure element as an application, and this can, application can be uh, remotely used as a TLS uh, server. And it stores uh, the pressure key uh, de defined by the application provider. Uh, when this application starts in the secure element, it creates a pair of uh, public and private key, and the public key is the identity of the secure element. Then afterwards, through uh, TLS PSK, the application provider delivers reads the public key of uh, the component and delivers a certificate. And they send uh, the pressure key of the component and uh, the server name of the component to uh, the user. The user open uh, a TLS connection with this component, reads the public key, it checks the certificate. And after it uh, verifies that the secure element both uh, know the unshake secret of the TLS uh, co connection and the public key. And if uh, the secure element uh, knows these both parameters, it means that uh, there is not a man in the middle because only one TLS session can be managed at a, at a given time. And because the secure element cannot be cloned, it's the only component uh, that uh, stores its. Uh, this uh, pair of uh, public and, uh, and private key. And at this level, the user can modify the pressure key. And so it's mean now it's the only uh, user, the only entity that can uh, remotely connect to this uh, secure element. So next slide, please. So at this moment, uh, uh, all this is uh, uh, available on uh, GitHub. Uh, there are no patents, and, uh, and all the code uh, this one is, is open. Uh, so there are code for TLSSE for Java card. Uh, this code uh, works with many uh, Java cards. The current level of Java cards that you can buy on the internet is uh, 3.04 or 3.05. This is the level of the Java card API. So if you go to, to GitHub, you, you will find this implementation that works quite should work with most of Java card components of the, on the market. And uh, as a scheme, as a syntax, it simply use a command line. So it's mean uh, when you want to create a key or to perform uh, signatures, 
you just open a TS session using OpenSSL and whatever you want with the secure element. And uh, you just uh, send a command line, uh, lat create T or sign and whatever. Uh, the code source of the server is uh, at this level, at this moment is V5. Uh, uh, it's a common, it's a, so it works with uh, Windows, it works with uh, like Unix environment and things like uh, Raspberry Pi. And this is an open implementation of the server that includes uh, two TCP IP daemon, one for RAX and one for TLS. And uh, inside the software, there's something when you use a secure element on a PC or, or Linux and whatever, you use an API called uh, PCSA, which, which mean, uh, uh, PCSA mean uh, smart cards uh, PC. And uh, inside the software, there is an, an emulation of uh, this API. So it's mean uh, doing that, uh, the software can be adapted very quickly to many kind of communication interface uh, with secure element, like uh, obviously PCSC or I2C or something called SIM arrays that exist today in the market. SIM array are array of uh, SIM cards that are used for, for roaming purpose. And so they have specific so socket interface. So next slide, please. And uh, that's it. So small question. Here you see there's a, a list of uh, papers that describe this and uh, and more, and uh, because you due, due to COVID and due to the fact that most of conference were uh, online this uh, last time, uh, there are video on YouTube that uh, explains the, the, the paper and give illustration of, of the process and so on. And so my hope should be that this, this, this draft uh, be, become a working group item. I believe it's open, it's some things not it is in the, I believe, uh, it is in the scope of uh, the CoinRJ group, and uh, and that's it. I am done. Thank you. There's one person in the queue, Eve. I'm just going to echo what was um, just asked as a question on the. Uh, in the chat, which is, can you help us, particularly those of us who are in other time zones, so we're only half awake, um, but, you know, the talk was very interesting. Thank you for your talk. But kind of the fundamental question is, help us connect the dots between what you were talking about and how this relates to in-network compute. And is it, I mean, for me, I, I definitely appreciate that there are, um, uh, potentially constrained devices that need helper processors um, that help to secure compute uh, and transmission. Um, but I'm not sure if that was sort of how you would connect the dots. So can you can you help explain to us how um, more pointedly this relates to coin? Thank you. Well, the way, when we use a security mechanism in the networks, uh, uh, when you compute uh, cryptography, I'm thinking to the previous um, presentation, for example, that was speaking of, uh, of, of blockchain issue and so on. Uh, when you use cryptography in the network, uh, you used to have some safe place to store key and uh, compute uh, cryptographic procedures. And uh, as it is today, uh, when you want to do that, uh, you could use stuff called hardware secure module in, uh, in, in the cloud, for example. But uh, let's say that uh, at the user level, uh, you have no trust insurance about that. And uh, as it is today, you have no open features. Uh, so the, the relationships to, to coin is that when you need some, this is a way to deploy uh, some secure procedure in the, in the internet. So it means each time you, you need to 
to do some things, to perform authentications, to, to perform signatures, uh, this could apply. And with some open stuff, it's not so simple to, to get open stuff today and uh, provable stuff. It's mean what is important with secure elements, they are they have some uh, ER level and this uh, level are certified by a national security agency, usually managed by governments. And this means this is your route of trust. And uh, there are many factors, manufacturers from that, and you have many standards that uh, apply to, 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 to this kind of component. So by nature, you have a lot of, of these components. You have 10 billion uh, secure elements uh, deployed every year. So it's very huge. And uh, the level of trust, uh, everybody knows that it's not so easy to hack a banking card uh, with uh, a chip inside. And so if you do that, you will get some, some money. But in the reality, this, this not happen. It's very difficult to download the software in a, in a bank card. It's very difficult to recover the card, the, the, the keys that are stored in the bank card. And so, relating to CoinRG, it means uh, it's a way to have uh, procedures, computing pro procedures hosted in the internet with, uh, I believe, uh, uh, not so bad uh, level of security and trust for the user. Thank you. Looks like we have another person in the queue and um, in the interest of time, perhaps we need to take that to the list. Um, Emmanuel Bacelli, uh, if you don't mind uh, submitting that either in the chat or to the list or both. I think we have okay. three minutes left. Um, yeah, oh my God. Uh, yes, I will slide, put the next slide. I will go back to, well, I, maybe we don't even need to have slides in the rest of time. Uh, we have, I'll, I'll load the, the chair slides. Um, okay, uh, we're at the last slide. Okay, so um, it's um, the um, some of the research group topics. Uh, actually, it, it, the the first one, the question about the interim, goes to the um, the second bullet. Actually, which is uh, we wanted uh, today to have a presentation about uh, the chair reflections after three years. Um, what has been the evolution of the group. I think today we had, uh, you know, some uh, presentations that went back to the original intent, which was like looking at transport, looking at security. But this field has, um, you know, exploded in the past uh, three years. And we wanted to have this, maybe this reflection. And we're thinking uh, we should have maybe uh, an interim uh, where we would, uh, first go through uh, the uh, the whole list of um, publications, drafts and, and, and related and see, you know, where we want to move things. Uh, Pascal asked for, uh, you know, should we have uh, his, his, his draft as a, as a working group? Uh, we can actually put that on the, on the list, by the way. And, and you know, go through the, 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 the current publications. There's some that are, um, um, expired that probably need to be uh, re, um, re um, kindled. So we'll do that probably um, maybe in, in January. Uh, obviously, there's going to be IETF 116 in uh, Japan in March, and we're going to most likely hold a meeting there. Um, and now my phone is telling me that it's 6.30. Uh, and then, 
there's this uh, 5G uh, net app lab proposal solicitation. There was an email on October 25th, which is a 5G. Um, um, I think it's an EU project. And I looked at the program at Hotnets next week, and there's a number of interesting papers that are um, related to this community. Uh, and we're out of time, and we're going to send Eve to bed, which is like 3.30 a.m. local time for her. And uh, thank you so much for attending. We had a bunch of people online. We had a, pe a bunch of people in the room. Uh, thank you for people who presented in particular. Uh, thank you for your dedication, for taking the time to do this presentation. Thank you for the people who asked questions, uh, because that shows that you follow what's going on, and it's really great. Thank you very much for Cedric to have been our proxy uh, in the room, and uh, thank you so much for having done that. And uh, thanks to Jeff, but Jeff, for you, it's uh, it's in the, well, it's early, early, early evening now, so you're probably okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll uh, have this interim, so we'll probably see you remotely sometimes in January. And um, thank you, and have a good rest of uh, the week. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marjorie.